Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are honored today to be joined by Professor David Palumbo Lou, Louise Hewitt Nixon Professor at Stanford University and Professor of Comparative Literature and English. He's the author of many books, among them, The Poetics of Appropriation, The Literary Theory and Practices of Wang to Wang Jing, 1045 to 1105, published by Stanford University Press in 1993. Asian American, Historical Crossings of a Racial Frontier, also published by Stanford University Press, 1999. Deliverance of Others, Reading Literature in a Global Age, which is published by our friends here at Duke University Press in 2012. And he's joining us today to talk about his most recent book, Speaking Out of Place, Getting Our Political Voices Back, which is published by our friends at Haymarket Books in late 2021. Of Speaking Out of Place, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, author of Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion, writes, in the face of accelerating fascism and, and a planet on fire, David Palumbo Lu provides a roadmap for founding our political voices by speaking out of place. This is an urgent call to seize the moment before it's too late. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing well, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here, and I, I look forward to our conversation. You, you know, David, you have been doing this, and, and by this I mean, obviously, as, as a very senior and accomplished scholar, but someone who's been agita agitating mm -hmm. um, on behalf of the truth for a long time. Um, talk a little bit about how you traveled to this moment to, to want and need to write a book like mm -hmm. Speaking Out of Place. Yeah, um, well, you know, before this book, I've been blogging a lot. And as you know, blogging is a very seductive <laughs> enterprise in that you're not writing for, you know, the ages, you're just responding to things that are happening. But so many of these blogs sort of accumulated, and I saw 2016 as a really pivotal moment that required to keep. And when he accepted the nomination at the Republican National Convention and Trump said, I am your voice and people cheered. That sent a shiver down my spine because by that point we knew what a fascist, racist, hate mongering, yeah. horrible person he was. Yeah. And I get politics, it's all about you know, representative government. But when you have that kind of a person getting the Republican nomination, and all that hate that we thought was sort of, it was there, but not under control, but there was some constraint and it became absolutely unconstrained. And what followed from that was, you know, Charlottesville, all these things just kept on unfolding. I thought that, that it was important to write a book about what was going on and particularly a book that would give us some empowerment against all that. You know, I, and I don't want to get too deeply into electoral politics, um, mm. but but we almost have to wonder, you know, had it been Hillary Clinton that was elected, not in 2016, but 2008, mm. or John McCain, who had been elected in 2008, would we have seen the same trajectory uh, in terms of a rise of fascism, uh, uh, whether that was embodied in Donald Trump or someone else? I mean, you, you seem to suggest in the book that if we go back really to the post-Clinton era, um, we see this rise of a kind of neoliberal yep. class in which, you know, Trump, Trump embodies it at the same time that he also embodies this, you know, virile anti-blackness mm, and, mm. and, and other kinds of uh, problematic politics that, you know, he expressed throughout, you know, his four years in, on the campaign trail. Yeah, um, I do believe that there's, uh, you know, America's always has this undertone that, that explodes and erupts and then it's sort of, you know, submerged under a kind of norm that people have accepted as, you know, standard racism, right? We get, we're cool with that level. Trump brought it all together in this package that really reanimated things in a virulent way. And that, as I say in the book, taps into similar kinds of movements across the globe. Uh, so I think that in Trump, you had something unusual and it's not exclusive to Trump in that, as you see today, it's continuing. It's not going anyplace. Yeah. You know, so he emboldened this and consolidated it 
into precisely a fascist figurehead. Um, and, you know, I do want to talk about electoral politics because I'm not a huge fan of it. Mm-hmm. On the mm-hmm. other hand, you know, it can buy us some time. I think we're, we really are in a historical moment now. It's, it's questionable what will happen, but we don't, we shouldn't be so, we shouldn't channel all of our energy into electoral politics. We got to do it. But the system is so stacked that the longer we defer into electoral politics, the more we lose sight of what we can do ourselves. And that's what the book is a lot, uh, about a lot, too. I mean, because at the same time you talk about this, uh, you know, the emergence of a very vibrant and visible, even mainstream, you know, socialist voice, mm-hmm. voices that have uh, 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 emerged and specifically thinking about someone like AOC. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I'm always chuckling, you know, when folks respond to, you know, well, they're too socialist this and they're too socialist that. And I'm like, you know, every one of you at some point are going to want to ch- uh, cash a social security check. Guess what? <laughs> right. Yep, yep, yep. And, and, and that's, you know, twofold, right? That, that is the failure of uh, our journalistic class Right. Mm-hmm. To, to really tell the story of history and, and broader you know, context when things occur. Um, but it also is the reality that, you know, people don't understand the ways in which the state in its best moments has been primed to really enhance the lives of citizens. Um, and, and that's really all most socialists you know, are asking for, particularly yeah. in, ter- in the arena of electoral politics. Absolutely. And, you know, if you just I, re- I remember after Bernie lost uh, you know, the nomination, and he, he met on Fox News, I think, you know, town hall, and he got people behind it because he didn't use the word socialist. Right. He said exactly right. what you did. He said, do you, do you look, would you like to have medical care? Would you like to have education? Would you like to have a, a retirement fund? And they said, yeah. I said, well, that's <laughs> socialism. <laughs> but it's, it's just because we've accepted, as you say, the, the labeling of pundits and the fear mongering of people. And I've had students say, you know, because I'll get into these moods, right? And they'll say, <laughs> well, you know, are, are you for government or are you against government? I said, it depends what the government is. If the government is of, for, and by the people, I'm all for it, right? If it's functioning the way it's supposed to. But we've, we've, been so hammered into this position of saying it's not as bad as it could be and that's not what quality of life is about that's not what we're all about here right is to accept it's not terrible that's you know why bother you know (laughs) you you mentioned that you get in these moods and, and i'd be remiss not to ask you um you know what it means to teach in the academy now when, uh, you know, I've been on sabbatical for a year, but I, I feel as I'm going back into the classroom, I'm already feeling these kind of constraints yep. that have been ongoing, you know, for almost a decade. And it seemed to have been concretized in the last year or two. Um, but, you know, the inability for us to feel comfortable as scholars, mm. you know, to have those kinds of moments, you know, where, yep. where, where we kind of break the wall and get real and push students beyond their comfort zone. There Mm -hmm. there seems to be almost a moment now where we're criminalizing. I mean, we see that Mm -hmm. in in the attacks on critical race theory, but we're, you know, we're critical, we're uh, criminalizing the ability to force students to be uncomfortable, you know, Mm -hmm. in their comfort. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The the whole idea of education is not to um, sort of move along a very linear trajectory, getting more and more and more into the space of what we're supposed to be. It's about always re-examining our assumptions, right? And our comfort zones and all of that, because so much of it is destructive and constraining, but we've accepted it because we just want to get to the next point in life. And it's slow and it's tedious, but there's some stuff that you need to look back at. I mean, when, you know, here at Stanford, we're going to build this big school for sustainability, you know, mm-hmm. for the environment. And it says all the right things, but, and we've pressed this, the, the founders of the school, will you accept money from fossil fuel companies? And I'm saying, well, we might need to have partners. <laughs> and, 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 and even that, that, you know, and even the titles, sustainability. I mean, if you look at what indigenous folks did, before colonialism, that was sustainability. The before the word, right. Before, right. before the word existed, it was a right. way of being together, right? And so I think a lot of students, um, right now, they're not comfortable for good reason, 
environment, racism, fascism, uh, the pandemic. You know, yes. all these systems are supposed to work. Mark, you know as well as I do, the pandemic didn't need to be nearly this bad. Yeah, right. You know, it didn't. It was politics. It was money. It was uh, nationalism. You know, if borders were really, co you know, if they weren't such obstacles to cooperation and if there was a political will, we could have done it. So a lot of my students, and I don't know how you feel there at Duke, but man, when I've gotten to the point where it's important to just take care of folks. Right. You know, we are damaged, we're beaten up, and they students appreciate it. I've had students say, nobody's ever asked me how I'm doing before. Right. You know, so I think the idea of surviving in the academy is to start small and keep the community going and be the person that you know people can come to year after year. That's the only way I've managed. How 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 have, how do you how do you work there? You know, it's much the same. I mean, it's been difficult in the last year and a half to to build those kind of relationships with students. Mm. You know, when you know, you know, we're back in person now, though I've been on sabbatical. But you know, that year that we were online, you know, it was a really uh, really a challenge. And, and one of the things I find interesting about this moment, because of the fears that universities have, uh, you know, is that it has created a context in which it's difficult to maintain and create what I would describe as intimate intellectual relationships with okay. students, right? Okay. You, you know, because it, it's like, you know, the neoliberals hear intimacy and for them, that's a translation into sexual, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. uh, and, no. and because of those fears, right, we're not able to really build the kind of intellectual communities you know, yep. that many of us came into the academy because it was one of the places where those relationships could flourish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was lucky to teach a course. Um, it was called Emergent Thinking. So obviously, you know, gesturing toward Adrian Murray Brown and uh, with uh, the director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts, Alan Holt, who's an amazing woman. It was called Emergent Thinking, Abolition and Climate Change. So half the class was like earth science people that were very into environmental justice. Other half, largely African American studies, but they saw that what we we're both trying to get at was a these systems have failed, mm -hmm. and there's no way to you know reform. The second is, again, the body counts. Our bodies have been totally, you know, frayed by this, and that love matters. And so we go and we say, you know, we love you. And it's not, you know, intimate or all, right. the, all the degraded ways right. that people think right. about it. But we have to love each other because we got to this place by forgetting that we're all in this together. If we look at it seriously rather than a kind of, you know, artificial way. The other problem is that with the whole DEI thing, universities have taken the discourse and solidified it into this cold, you know, yeah. bureaucratic right. thing that frankly is all about public relations and avoiding lawsuits. Absolutely. It has Absolutely. no educational, you know, nothing Absolutely. to do with the words, right? I, I was surprised, you know, you began this book someplace where I didn't didn't expect you to begin mm. the book. Um, and, and that's on uh, the sports field in the arena, mm. uh, beginning with Colin Kaepernick and, and what, you know, now I think, you know, 50 years from now, we will reflect upon as kind of a signature moment mm you know, in terms of resistance in this country, particularly amongst young folks and the ways that, you know, as you lay out in the book that we think now about 1968 and, and a few moments before that. Why did you begin with Colin Kaepernick? Well, because exactly what you said, you know, and especially since I'm here in the Bay Area uh, yeah. and he, he grew up just what, and all the things that are coming out now were already present in terms of who gets to make a gesture, who gets to redefine right. what it is. And, you know, as I was researching more and more sports, like the, the, the seminal moment for me was Jackie Robinson. Robinson, yeah. You know, because, you know, this is for your audience. He's, this is the late forties and he's made it as a dog, made it as a black man in white field. And so he's like a huge hero. When he was signed on to the Dodgers, Brand Freaky said, you know, we're willing, this great experiment, right? But keep your mouth shut. 
you know, just play ball, keep your mouth shut. And so, and, and you know, I understand, well, I don't understand it, but I understand it at the time. <laughs> and of course, same era, Paul Robeson, who's also an athlete, a very, right, very right. great athlete. Accomplished, yes. <laughs> um, is um, making these political speeches in Europe about socialism, communism, et cetera. And so the U.S. government wants to go after him. And what better way to do it than to get another black man to go after him, you know? So they called Jackie Robinson to the House on American Activities Committee. And, you know, what's he going to do? Because they, he knows what they want out of him. He knows, you know, they haven't written the script, but, you know, right. they've made it clear. But he gets there. And, well, to begin with, he doesn't decline the invitation. He goes. Right. Right. And then he says something that they don't want to hear. You know, they say, he says, he talks about racism. He talks about yeah. being busted in the military. He's, right. you know, he was told to sit in the back of the military bus in uniform. Right. And so when, the, so the book is called Speaking Out of Place. Here he is in a place where this kind of stuff is not supposed to happen. He's supposed to stay on script. He uses that moment of, you know, celebrity to indict the system and, that's what I'm saying that, I mean, it's not just in terms of the educational place, every place we need to speak up and do the unexpected because we've been trained to think that certain things are not possible. Right. Who would imagine doing what Jackie Robinson did, but after he did it, that planted a seed in people's minds. And I think that goes through 68 and yep. on up, you know? You know, it's fascinating. Um... Because, you know, the fact that racism, white racism understood the dynamic of trying to find the, the, the counter, you know, mm -hmm. to Paul Robeson, right? Even mm -hmm. though Robeson's older, right? Much more established, yeah. in yeah. some ways, much more well-known as a mm -hmm. global figure at, at mm -hmm. that point in time. Mm -hmm. and, and Jackie Robinson doesn't, you know, take it, right? He, mm -hmm. he does not bite at that, right? He, he reframes it. And just 20 years in the future, Right. When you have a, another generation, another rise of very politicized black athletes. Right. Mm -hmm. Most well known in terms of Ali. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as you write about in the yeah. book, Tommy Swift and John Carlos, Lou Alcindor mm -hmm. slash, you know, um, mm -hmm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And, and you get a figure like O.J. Simpson. Right. Mm -hmm. Who in some ways is pushed to the culture, is celebrated as a counter like in, on yep. the football field directly yep. to Jim Brown. But right. But also to this Absolutely. other generation of of figures. And things had changed so significantly in those 20 years that, you know, O.J. Simpson could make the choice not to be a race man. Mm -hmm. Right. There's yeah, a way yeah. in which for Jackie Robinson, that was not a choice. Right. He was always going, always had to be a race man. So even if he might not agreed with Robeson's politics. Right. Mm -hmm. He saw a higher collectivity mm -hmm. right, in that moment. Right. Yep, that, that brought yep. him and Robeson together. And, and O.J. Simpson and others after him of that ilk could reject that. You know, which I think is one of the ways that Ka Kaepernick is so fascinating, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it's not that I would just simply say that, you know, contemporary athletes in general or Black athletes in particular are apolitical, right? But but they've been socialized not to think about politics, right? From, from very young ages, right? You know, yep. when they're on travel teams, the AAU mm -hmm. circuit in terms of basketball, mm -hmm. the, the only goal is to be a good basketball player and win a ring right or yeah, multiple yeah. rings right mm -hmm, and and mm -hmm. so you know in that way they're really oblivious to politics in terms of what's going on and for Kaepernick to make that choice you know is really striking that particular moment because what's the gain yeah <laughs> right right well what is there for him to gain to make that kind of uh, yeah. choice and, and symbolism yeah I mean I'm just two things I mean I remember seeing OJ in the Avis commercials, remember those? <laughs> you know, he was the black business. He had a little briefcase. <laughs> running through leaving, the airport. <laughs> running through the airport. You know, I got to try hard because, you know, we're number two. So he, that was the black bourgeoisie, right? Yeah. With the suitcase yeah. and the suit. And the person, because I went to Berkeley as a, as a student, the person who brought this album for me was Harry Edwards. Edwards, absolutely. You know, it was just a wake up to the whole structure of exploitation, marketing, everything. And I think that that was another pivotal moment that was sort of a counteract, a counteract this movement toward the bourgeoisie yeah. was understanding what price that, the price you had to pay to get there, right? Uh, when you talk about speaking out of place, uh, you also examine the Occupy moment, um, mm -hmm. the Occupy movement of, of 2011. And 
you know, things have moved so fast in the last 11 to 12 years. I think there are folks, you know, even young folks who have forgotten about that moment and how that moment is really, you know, a precursor, you know, to the protests around Trayvon Martin in 2012 mm-hmm. and, and Black Lives Matter after that, um, you know, the, 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 the pink pussy parades, mm-hmm. you know, in 16 mm-hmm. and 17, even mm-hmm. me too, right? The mm-hmm. energy to organize is really grounded in that Occupy moment. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that moment for our audience and, and why you think right. it was significant to, you know, the moment that we're in now. Because, well, to begin with, uh, we've talked a little bit about language, you know, DEI, whatnot, mm-hmm. corruption of language. Uh, and often people can consolidate a huge mindset into one expression. And what Occupy did is the, the 1%. I mean, it came down to understanding the concentration of wealth and power and that it was so out of whack with any sense of what might be called democracy, right? So political forms, economic systems, the Occupy movement got in your face. I mean, it was on Wall Street. It was, bankers would go to work and they would have to pass through this. And that's what I mean by occupying space is to to make visible violence, make visible uh, the kinds of things that we shut aside and don't want to look at uh, because we want to go on with the business of reproducing things that create that mm-hmm. violence, right? Mm-hmm. We don't understand the how we are complicit in if we don't speak up in perpetuating this. There's a, I got to tell the story. There is a, um, a, a fundraiser. I was told it was for um, Code Pink, which is, you know, I'm very supportive of that. So I went and put, it was actually Code Pink had a table. It was part of this larger fundraiser in a very wealthy community in the Bay Area called Moms Against Poverty, which is an international organization. It sounds great. But I went there. I've never seen so many rich people in my life for, a, you know, a fundraiser for War Against Poverty, you know, or Moms Against Poverty. And I thought, you know, these folks don't understand how the governments that make them wealthy are creating the poverty that poverty. they're fighting. They right. just, they don't right. see the connection between the two. Right. So that was sort of a negative example of what I'm talking about. We need to put on display, not wealth, which we're used to celebrating. Our whole culture is about achieving that. And we don't want to put on display poverty either. We want to put on display people working for justice. They, even in small gestures, and this gets back to Adrian Marie Brown, we don't have to tackle the world just in our own behavior, yeah. in the classroom, in our communities. And it doesn't have to be a bombastic speaking up, but just saying, no, that's not right. No, I don't accept that. Can't we look at it in a different way? Can't we behave differently? And that's what Occupy started to do. It was, it was um, enthusiastically anarchistic because, yes. <laughs> you know, because you know about movements, they, they, and June Jordan writes about this all, you know, they can solidify very quickly into, okay, the leaders count and to write out again, the people that are supposed to be now designated as followers. And so Occupy suspended that, that acceleration yeah, right. into leadership right. organization. It was an experiment. And when people fault it, um, well, don't fault it on your terms. Look at what it was trying to do, do in the first right. place. Right. And so I think it did something really, it was consciousness raising to the nth degree. And as you say, things that followed after that took on some of that tenor. And we're coupling you know, economic issues, issues of race, issues of misogyny. And people are understanding it all comes from the same source. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these, you know, we don't have, it's, our, our, the opposition is doing us the favor. They're not, they're not <laughs> complex. It's this, the same, you know, exclusionary, anti-human um, set of folks that, that we're used to deferring to. Yeah. And look at where they've got us. They, they're the most irresponsible. That's why I say in the book, we defer to leaders who are the most irresponsible people in the world. <laughs> and, you know, we have, we have a war going on now, you know. We don't get, I mean, I can start talking about that. I, I want, I want to keep, I want to keep in, in, in your space. You know, I don't want, to, I don't want to hijack the conversation. But um, whatever, whatever your listeners you think would want to hear, I, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, yeah David, uh, 
you know, you spend some time riffing off the work of Henri Lefebvre in mm-hmm. terms of the right of the city. And, and again, this piece about talking about language, you know, the, the distinction between what we hear when we hear gentrification, mm. you know, th- though I will say that, you know, for some Black communities, when they hear gentrification, they know it's dislocation. Right? Mm-hmm. But, yep, but yep. for other folks, you know, dislocation, you know, really articulates something very different and distinct. And that's actually what's happening. Mm-hmm. Right. Within this framework of gentrification. Absolutely. Right? And you also talk about, you know, the, the electronic surveillance that occurs, you know, in the aftermath of this kind of moment. But, you know, to be real for a moment. Right. We're, we're both scholars at the elitist of the elite institutions. Right. It ain't mm-hmm. Harvard. But, you know, <laughs> th- those are th- those are our institutions aspirations. Right. And and living and working in these spaces, right? You know, I, I you know I live I've been living in the South now for for eighteen years. Mm. You know, the worst thing in the world is to need a cup of coffee and have to stop in a gas station on the road. Yeah. You know, in the South, right? Mm-hmm. It's like so. Mm. You know, when I'm here, that that Duke is putting money and putting money there, and at least two years ago, that might have been a Starbucks coming, right? That got me excited. I'm not so excited about the Starbucks piece now, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, how do you weigh the contradictions, you know, as scholars like us, right, at places like Duke and Stanford, where our institutions such have such a huge footprint, right, in the towns and places in which we live and around us, and, and that we, uh, on one level, obviously derive obvious benefits from that, right? You know, how do we hold our institutions accountable, right, to being equitable and fair, <laughs> right, mm-hmm. and thoughtful, and, and real citizen partners, you know, mm. with the communities that, mm-hmm. that inevitably they're going to displace. Yeah. Well, um, to begin with, thank God we're not at Harvard, man. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Say what you will. Um, but I have I have an actual example of of how this ha- this we can do stuff, which is that, you know, um, like Duke, like every other big university, Stanford has a vexed relationship with the with the town and if you i was i taught at oxford for what there was actually way back in you know founding times there was a rev the, the whole town gown thing happened because there was a riot when oxford tried to get into the town <laughs> and and the town didn't want it you know no matter what the, the fancy hats and all that that was okay you could do without it but every three years stanford has to renegotiate what's called the gut which is the general use permit and that's the time for the city and the county to say, okay, if you want this, you got to give us that. So this is the trade-off. And so, oh man, Stanford spends millions of dollars on attorneys, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And students, graduate students mostly, but also staff and workers formed a working group that worked for, they, they knew they had a three-year window. So for three years, they put together this campaign. And I went there and I was part of the whole, because they took testimony and whatnot. And we had all our deans lined up saying, we're going to discover the secret to life. If you just give us, you know, 400 more square feet. (laughs) And I got up and I said, yeah, we might, but, you know, we're not doing it by ourselves because somebody's cleaning up your labs. You know, somebody's cooking your food and they're not making a living wage. Right. So how can you build up? And we had people, person after person, group after group saying, okay, we want better healthcare. We want, you know, housing for graduate students, blah, blah, blah. And believe it or not, the, we had done such bridge work with, with the political structure here. And they were listening. They were listening because they knew we were organized. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, okay, we will put, we will take on your, your conditions and your demands. And they put them to Stanford and Stanford, said, I don't want to use a bad language on your program. They said, forget <laughs> it. They said, forget it. The only, I think it was the only time in history Stanford just left the table wow. because we had said, we, you know, Stanford's great, but it's not great on its own. Yeah. Right. There's right. a community right. here. You got to pay right. attention to it. So that's what we did. And I think that that was such a good education for students, you know, that, it's only by partnerships and solidarity that you can make it through. And you're not going to succeed all the time, but the point is beyond just immediate success. It's who you are as a person. 
it's understanding how humanity can really make an argument for what it thinks is right, not what it's told is right. Let me ask you, David, um, and, and I, you know, intimated this earlier. Um, what has, you know, we know that the world has changed, mm, mm. right? You know, over these last 20, 30, 40 years, mm. the last two years, the last six years. Um, what has changed for you in, in terms of your outlook on the work that you do and what's mm. important and what's vital to you at this stage in your career and your life? Yeah. Well, you know, Mark, I forget when we last saw each other, but see all this gray here? <laughs> uh, that's a very clear sign of what's changed. And aging, and you have many, many years before you have to worry about this stuff. Um, it really puts things in perspective. You know, you think about, not a legacy, but you thought, you think about, I think there's a really good documentary on man's list called A Well-Spent Life, you know? And to me, it really is... Um, a lot of what I've been saying, which is think about well, after Trump was elected, I was I drove home thinking, you know, well, something's you know, going to change. My wife was there. She was crying. I said, let's see what happens in the morning. Morning verified the results. And I just said, we got to start. We can't. We have to. I just we got to hug each other. You just start reinforcing the intimacy that is there. And then you reappraise the world. And I've come to the point now where I'm really putting a thousand percent into teaching because students are so, I mean, I teach a, this thing at Stanford called a sophomore seminar exclusively for sophomores. And I looked at my class and I said, you've led your entire college career so far in a pandemic on Zoom. How can I, how can I teach you thinking I should expect exactly the same thing as if we were all unmasked doing face-to-face, -face. you adjust to the reality of the world and you do what you're capable of doing. So um, part of the, the book manuscript, so the manuscript for Speaking Out of Place turned out to be too long. Uh, Haymarket didn't ask me to cut anything. They're very good, but I decided, okay, I'd take out a couple of chapters. So the two chapters that I'm working on now that would be part of the second book are about education and human rights. And they're about human rights from the standpoint of groups who decide to give themselves rights yeah. rather than. So I'm thinking in, in a way, small units, but I'm also thinking in those small units about teaching us not to be so constrained by the idea of individualism and our happiness and all that to see we need each other. Yeah. And we can't, we can't be mutually supportive if we're all trying to be like OJ jumping over those, you know, things to make the play. That, that is the image of, to me, not individualism, but alienation, yeah. you know, and it has to do with our relationship to the planet too. So that's where I am right now is to be coming less bombastic, although you would maybe not agree with that, but to really <laughs> care for people to care, cause it's caring for yourself too. I mean, it's, it's that. And it means so much to people. And I'll, I'm obviously going to continue my activism, but really understanding that putting energy into institutions, it's, it's mostly, I don't know, I, I feel frustrated. I feel like yeah. you've got a good yeah. program there. You seem to have support, but um, enjoy what you've created and yeah. make sure it's there and grow that. And you can't change everybody's minds. You don't need yeah. to. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. That is such wonderful advice, David. Uh, mm. We've been honored today to be joined on Left of Black by Professor David Palumbo, Louis, Louise Hewlett, Nixon Professor at Stanford University and Professor of Comparative Literature and English, uh, the author of many books that you should read, uh, but notably the most recently published Speaking Out of Place, Getting Our Political Voices Back, published by Haymarket Books. Thank you for getting up early on, on the West Coast <laughs> to talk with us, um, David. Thank you for having me. It's been a, sure, uh, a true pleasure, really. I love thank talking you, to you. Anyway, thank you. David. Okay, <laughs> you take care. Take care. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back.